missing, but that should be okay. Okay, great. So welcome to today's network service, uh, service mesh meeting. And as always, we start with agenda bashing. So if you see anything that is not on the list, uh, please add it. And also please add yourself to the attendees list. <clears throat> Okay, so events, we have KubeCon uh, on December 10th, so just a month away from 10th to 13th. Uh, so I believe the 10th is the day before the conference and there's some, uh, there's some mini summits that are going on. So uh, we have a FIDO mini summit that we have a couple things that um, are gonna be presented and uh, there's also a open source commons, which we may end up giving a talk there as well. Um, so we have two talks at the main session, an intro and a deep dive. So feel free to, uh, to join in and, um, and listen or get involved and help if you'd like. Uh, we, have, we are currently working on a NSM demo for KubeCon. There's actually a few demos that we're working on. Uh, one of them is the is trying to get things set up for the VNF CNF comparison. We have more to discuss later in the agenda. Uh, we are also working on a standalone network service mesh uh, demo so that we can uh, so that we can show it off during the uh, presentations. Uh, we also are looking for people who wish to uh, to do some form of a recorded. Uh, pod, podcast or join in on various other things or looking for people to write blog posts. So any help that you can, that you have either something you want to do yourself or help others with, that'd be absolutely fantastic. <coughs> we also have a, um, the final mini summit listed with a session on, with, I think it was a one or two sessions. Uh, is doing two sessions now, Ed, at final mini summit? Uh, hang on a second. I've lost the mute button. There we go. All right. So yeah, it is going to be actually, um, it looks like two sessions. The one you got listed there from our friends at Oreo Networks. And then I think Tom Herbert also has one that he's doing. Yeah, Tom has one that was accepted in as well. So, okay. So a couple of, a couple of announcements. Uh, Volk has put out a second uh, network service mesh video. Uh, this one's a five minute one. And the link has been added to the uh, to the list. So sometime after the meeting, go ahead and uh, and uh, take a look at it. It uh, I have not seen it yet, so but I, I suspect it's probably going to talk a little bit about the problem that we're trying to solve with network service mesh. We should, we should probably take down an action item to get a link to some of these videos onto the network service mesh site. Um, <clears throat> because I think they're, they're quite helpful. Um, and it would be good to get them linked in from the NSM site and possibly also from our readme. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So, and, uh, Ed and I also gave a, uh, uh, it's an interview at the Cloud Unfiltered podcast that's hosted by Cisco, and we've also posted the uh, the link there. So that one is a is a bit more. Uh, I think it's a 30, 30 minute uh, talk that we ended up giving. That's about right. Okay, so on to the agenda board, which, so the agenda board, uh, actually we haven't added the stuff from the, the past week that we were that we were adding. So my proposal is, is instead of doing the agenda board today, uh, we have a section where we're talking about the changes that we're making and then next week we'll be back to the agenda board. Does, uh, does that sound reasonable to you? 
That's good to me. How does it sound to everyone else? Okay, we'll say it sounds good. <laughs> uh, okay, let's uh, let's start into uh, I guess first item on the agenda: KubeCon uh, demo for Network Service Mesh. Yeah, so the, the slides actually on that link haven't particularly changed. Um, the there there was some thinking about basically a sort of a, a fairly basic format for that being first tell a bit of a story, probably a trimmed down version of Sarah's story, then uh, literally just have a very simple one or two cube control applies um, that make it real. Uh, and then the third part is being able to visualize it, hopefully with the um, skydive integration <clears throat> so that people can see the result. That was kind of the, the, the set of thinking that we, that that I was having about that. For that, I think we, we've got basically three things. Uh, one is that we will need someone to help with getting a, a sort of a shrunk down version of Sarah's story that can be used for, um, you know, <clears throat> for the demo to present the sort of what are we talking about. Uh, the second one is, and this is stuff that we're all working on, which is delivering the working network service mesh stuff. And we're getting, you know, quite close to the first drop for that. Um, and then the, the third <clears throat> is um, the skydive integration. I know we've got folks, including uh, David, who are looking at that as well. Um, so d how do folks feel about that as sort of the one, two, three of the demo? I think that sums it up quite, uh, quite well. Um, so for the narrative, though, the one thing that we need to be a, a bit careful with is to make sure that the narrative that we're giving matches the the code for the network service endpoint that we're providing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we need a little bit of collaboration on that side. Um, I suspect that the uh, components in the skydive, uh, because of the way that it's visualizing, don't need to have as quite as as tight of an, of an integration from that perspective, but we should make sure that uh, that the what's being presented is uh, is uh, impactful for the uh, for the demo for the demo. So um, let's see. We also don't have a, a skydive section on here, so I'll add something to the to the demo or to the I know. I, I know there's been a lot of activity there, um, trying to sort of sort things out, figure out where the APIs are, et cetera. So, <clears throat> let's see. We have a section on the um, on the code as well. Um, so let's let's go ahead and uh, uh, talk a little bit about that, and then we'll jump. To, then we'll continue on with the. Um, with the uh, agenda for uh, for Andre. So in terms of the code, we've done quite a lot of work to uh, simplify uh, net the network service mesh. So do you want to do you want to start off, Ed, and talk about some of the changes that we've uh, that we've made? Yeah. So effectively, <clears throat> network service mesh has become much more microservicey um, in the sense that. You've got a bunch of small components that are talking to each other with well-defined gRPC APIs. Um, and the, the biggest change that's going on right now is trying to get, um, so it, it turns out, and we found this out last week, and I'm kind of embarrassed that we didn't find this out until last week. It turns out that BPP actually has a something that exposes a gRPC API for it already. It's called BPP agent. And so we can simply just run BPP agent <clears throat> and point to it as a gRPC client. And this makes uh, the data playing part of the story for us so much easier because literally all we're doing is translating from the network service mesh data plane API to the VVP agent API and they're both gRPC. So <clears throat> it becomes super, super easy um, to do that. So we're in the process of making that transition currently. Um, the good news is the VPP agent's been pretty well hardened. It's actually been used in shipping product. Um, so that, that should hopefully take care of a bunch of stuff for us with using VPP. They've also done the work to make the container for it super small. So I think the container for VPP agent, which includes both the agent and VPP, is something like 64 megabytes, um, which is pretty respectable, uh, given that it's got both of them in there and doing their thing. Um, 
<clears throat> do, do you have other things that folks would like to point out or talk about? I know you've been doing a lot of work on um, sort of the CRDs and the NSE, NS, NSC to NSM stuff, Frederick. Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing that, uh, the biggest change that I made in regard to the CRDs is the, historically the network service um, endpoints uh, had a, was driving a single API that was the, the registration of the network service was the same API that was being exposed to CRD and the same, the exact same model. And one of the things that we came to the realization was that uh, having, that this wasn't a particularly good idea. So we ended up separating them out. So one of them is just pure protobuf and the other one is just a structure that is gen that generates a client set for Kubernetes and generates the clients necessary for for us to get cube uh, cube control integration and so on, but is very closely aligned with um, with how Kubernetes expects things. And the way that it, what Kubernetes does is the CRDs have uh, what three sections. It has uh, metadata where you put in things like names and labels. It has the spec, which is things that uh, that are properties of the system that you don't expect to change or like configuration. So the spec could include things like, what is the payload of a network service? And you have the status and the status is like, is this thing online? What's, <coughs> what's the IP address uh, and so on. And so we've, uh, so it's very much, uh, it's, it's more closely aligned with what Kubernetes now expects from, uh, from uh, its, CRDs. And so effectively now you can do cube control get network services and you'll get a list of network services. Cube control get network service endpoints and um, uh, get cube control get network service managers and you'll get a you'll get a list and status of of, of these various things. And uh, it all just works it and you can also access them programmatically. Uh, I've also written something so that when the first network service manager comes online, it checks to see if the CRD has been created and auto creates it. And so spinning up uh, and adding the CRDs is just as simple as, as running the application. And so we have, uh, so we have quite a few things that have been added in from, from that respect, but the, at the end result is we ended up with something that's a bit more simple because we, we don't have to worry about how is this thing, if we make a change to the protocol, uh, we can iterate on it and not have to worry whether we're breaking uh, every, every consumer of that CRD. So, um, and beyond that, uh, I've also we've also isolated the portions of the registration. So we, I've I've called I'm, right now I'm calling it a registry, and effectively that's what publishes the network services and endpoints and so on. So this information doesn't have to live on Kubernetes but we implemented a Kubernetes component, the microservice that knows how to publish this on, on Kubernetes and then uses Kubernetes for the, book, for the bookkeeping. So in the future, if someone decides to build something out for another scheduler or another orchestration system that is not Kubernetes, then this is the component that you'd, uh, that you'd end up having to replace uh, in order to work out where our network service is and where do I, where do I find them. And so, so, so breaking out the endpoints or the APIs from that respect uh, all also simplifies the, um, I'm not gonna say it future proofs, but it, it gets us a long way there. Cool. Um, and so the last thing I'm working on right now is an ICMP responder, since that's like the hello world of uh, network services. <laughs> <laughs> It is the simplest network service endpoint. Yeah, it's the simplest one that I know of. There's, there may be a simpler one out there somewhere, but <clears throat> none that I'm aware of at this point. Um, is there, is there anything else that you can, um, that you, that you can think of that we need to add in? Mm, I, I think that's probably the, 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 the piece right there that comes to mind on, on sort of the what's going, what's been happening. So there's been a lot of stuff moving in the code base. If you've been sort of watching. Um, a ton of really cool stuff has happened in the last couple of weeks, um, and things are really starting to fire on all cylinders. Um, one of the other nice things, by the way, <clears throat> about this refactor is that it makes it possible to run um, component-to-component -component integration tests. Um, 
without having to stand up an entire Kubernetes cluster. Um, so it, it, for, for certain kinds of, of, you know, edit, compile, run loops, um, you know, it, it shortens an edit, compile, run from edit, compile, run, deploy to edit, compile, run, um, which can speed up development a great deal. And uh, we got uh, Go Build working again. So before there was a C project, a C Go project that got included in that uh, would break the Go Build. Um, and so there's a pull request that's pending uh, that fixes all that as well. And also gets us off of the C Go and gets us onto the native Go runtime, which is absolutely huge because that's where 90% of the work in Go in the runtime is uh, focused on the Go runtime, not the C Go runtime. So, so we're in good company there. Yeah, it, it, it ends up being, that's sort of a side effect of the VPP, consuming VPP agent, which is by consuming VPP agent, the APIs we see are all gRPC. And the only thing we have to do is take a VPP agent container off the shelf and swap in the configuration files that we need. And it's good to go. Cool. Oh, so, is is there any other any other questions or anything that people uh, people would like to uh, drill down on this? Okay. With that, uh, Andre, uh, do you have a update on uh, Packet uh, .net, uh, CI work? Uh, no, nothing changed on my side for for Packet .net. I, I, I think the packet.ci stuff is basically just working um, about 90% of the time. We still do have a little bit of occasionally we can't get a packet. Um, occasionally the packet deploy job fails still. And I'm told that they're in the process of rolling out something they think will fix that. Um, <clears throat> and so basically if we um, if we get that solid enough, then the, the, the sort of question emerges, at what point do we retire the Travis CI? I actually don't see a reason. I personally don't see a reason to keep Travis around at this point, primarily because we're doing the full build on uh, Circle CI and Travis's du is duplication. And if the if the CI fails with uh, packet deploy, it fails the build anyway. Like Travis doesn't pass the build uh, and override the failure of Circle CI. Do other folks have opinions? Ah, this is what happens when I search for Safari. Um, let me go ahead and actually just share what the Circle CI build looks like because it's actually kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> I could find the proper share button. So this is kind of what the Circle CI looks like right now. Can folks see the the share that I've got with Circle CI? I can see it. Awesome. Yeah. Effectively, one of the nice things that we've done is um, for most of the containers, we've sort of broken them off into parallelizable build steps. And it turns out that most of these parallelizable build steps. Are you on uh, mute? I can't hear you. Uh, I do. I am not on mute. Can other people hear me? Uh, yes, I can, I can hear you. you. Okay. Um, all right. Can you so? It looks like we may have lost Frederick's audio. But effectively, we've, we've broken these down into very small steps that actually end up being pretty fast to build. <clears throat> um, and also gives you really granular visibility into what's going on. Because if you're like, OK, well, what failed? OK, well, building this container failed. OK, that's not good. You can just scroll down into precisely what failed for that container. So I, I, as CI gets more complicated, one of the things that drives me, frankly, completely crazy, personally, is when you get the giant monster log of doom and you have to be very skilled to figure out why the hell that CI broke. And one of the nice things with Circle CI is that you don't have that. Frederick, are you back? 
I am back. Cool. So, do folks have do do folks have other feelings on the um, on disabling Travis? Anyone in favor of not disabling Travis? All right then, it looks like we're probably gonna disable Travis. Hello? Yep, okay, so let's go ahead and add that to uh, as an action item. Um, let's see. I'll go ahead and add that right now. So, so in terms, so let's uh, jump into the uh, VNF CNF uh, comparison then. So, let's see, is Taylor on right now, or is he is he in this TSC at the moment? I, we, I'm here. Oh, this is Taylor. We have several Volk co-op. Can you hear me? I hear you, Taylor. Great. Okay. So let's see. We created this aggregate project view since there's so many things going on. Um, I just posted in the chat. And <clears throat> we have sub projects for each of the, I guess, larger components. So there's a project for the OpenSAC that's in progress right now. The testing for the VPP Neutron plugin is one of the main items that's being worked on. Um, most of the rest of the OpenSAT cluster that we're going to be using for the test is, is done. Um, deployments are automated and being documented and everything. So it's the, the stuff with the VPP Neutron. And then once we have um, access to a, an environment that we feel is stable enough, then we're going to start doing some of the updates and for the actual test case where we'll be uh, connecting all the VNFs through the VPVV switch. On the Kubernetes side, um, we've added support for Ubuntu um, as a host OS to cross-cloud. So that'll be something that um, NSM can use for any of y'all's testing. It's been CoreOS before, so you can use CoreOS or Ubuntu at this point for host OS containers, so the CNFs don't matter, so just the host OS. And let's see, the um, a lot of the host configuration that we'd like to use for performance and stuff has been done as part of the packet generator, uh, so the system that's actually sending the traffic from T-Rex and NFE bench driving that has been done in that, and that's going to be rolling into all of the worker nodes and make that available. So right now, that's we can deploy and provision a packet system with dual Mellanox NICs, and it gets updated with all of the host settings and kernel configuration reboots in the boxes then available. We can also provision a um, quad port Intel. So this is something that right now we only have access to, but quad port Intel um, NICs. And we have provisioning working for both of those configurations. We have some re reserve systems. So this is kind of early access before that configuration is made publicly available um, for everyone else. Um, I think all of that uh, provisioning software is going to be useful as NSM gets past a lot of the functional testing and wants to target real specific things. So um, all that's publicly available. And we've been working on the, the VPP uh, vSwitch setup for the test case and the, the provisioning of that, being able to support both the um, so our test cases are direct CNF uh, connections between um, each container over MIF, as well as 
a secondary comparison to show a more direct apples to apples is going to be all the CNFs go through the V-switch in a snake, which is what you have to do on the VNF side. So we're doing both of those in Kubernetes and in the process of building out the provisioning for that. We also have a lot of results from um, Macek, um, Peter, Michael, and a bunch of people that have been working on testing the software on the CSET lab side and, and validating that they're getting the expected results from the daily runs that happen um, um, in the CSIT lab and comparing those to what we have. And then we're rolling and merging anything that's um, ready back into the code so that we can optimize. It. Most of the results are pretty raw and they're going right into the uh, repo. But if feel free to look at those in the CNF repo. Um, some of them are direct dumps from NFV bunch, and, and then there's some summaries and a couple of markdowns. But I think that's probably it for us. Cool. Nice. Okay, so any uh, questions before we move on? Okay, let's um, let's see about jumping into the skydive. And do we have the right people to talk about skydive on the call right now? Yeah, I'm here. Cool. If you can uh, state your name out so that we can know who we're talking with. Uh, This uh, David. Uh, yeah, please. Okay, cool. So, so in terms of the the skydive, so um, one of so one of the things that we need to get to you is the monitor the monitor endpoint. And so, uh, what we're I, I wanted to, to mention about two areas where where you can pull information. One of them has been uh, built out already. Uh, the second one is uh, need, we need to uh, write a uh, hey, monitor connection on. So, so to start off with, uh, so here's here's one question, um, and uh, Ed, I want your opinion on this as well. Do we do we want Skydive to pull directly from Kubernetes some of the topology information, or do we want it to pull? Um, do we want to expose that? Through a uh, through a monitor endpoint that uh, that pulls off changes from network services, network service endpoints, and so on, and uh, passes them along to to Skydive. So I, I think that the, the reality is that Kubernetes. We don't have any plans on the record of making Kubernetes aware of the connection by connection topology of network service mesh, uh, and I, right. I think probably for the best because I, I, I think frankly that would be uninteresting to the Kubernetes layer and ultimately not helpful. Um, so I think we're kind of left with having some kind of an API, you know, we can call it monitor connections for one of a better term that is available from the network service, uh, the NSMD <clears throat> that, that basically we would just provide information about those connections and changes in them that could go northbound uh, and be integrated with by a variety of things, one of them being skydive. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so the connections are fully agree. That should be a generic monitor connections. So the the second one is what about the at this point? What about the uh, the network service and network service uh, endpoints? Because those do land in Kubernetes. <coughs> one, one option that we have for the interest of time is we could pull information out of those, and they have very well built clients, or the second approach is we could wrap those clients around uh, gRPC and just expose the ex expose the network service endpoints themselves as a uh, as a gRPC uh, endpoint. My my guess is that it kind of ends up looking like the following, um, <clears throat> which is my guess is that the um, 
you've got two sets of problems with Skydive. The, the first problem is how do you find network service managers that you can ask for topological information? And then the second, right. is, the second set of information then is, okay, having gotten that, <clears throat> how do you actually go and ask them for topological information? It strikes me that the um, how to find a network service manager is something that probably is best done um, via the CRDs because those are sort of clearly visible and out there. Um, <clears throat> and then, although uh, the discovery piece of that you could do via um, gRPC if you were to bring in something like the NMS, the NSM K8s, which will give you a gRPC if that's what you prefer to consume. Uh, it gives you a nice little adapter there for discovery. Um, and then the, the other question is, so, so paint me the picture of what it would look like representing a bunch of network service endpoints in the absence of their links in, in Skydive. Yeah, I'm not sure what the, what that would uh, that would look like. Like it could be, it could look like a, like a node because there, there is something there. So we could we could show a, a node that is isolated uh, that nothing has any connections to yet, and then the actual connections when someone says create a connection or close a connection uh, can become edges uh, from clients to to those endpoints. Yeah, I, I think we get sort of two, <coughs> um, we, we wind up with sort of, of the following things, which is um, you wind up with network service. Yeah, so it's the nodes and the edges. The edges we can discover from, um, the edges we can discover from the, um, the monitor connections kind of stuff. And you're suggesting possibly getting the nodes from K8s. That would give you uh, the nodes from, the network service endpoint nodes, but of course, network service clients don't actually advertise themselves for discovery. So, right, you know that 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 would have to be sorted out. Hey, yes. um, so question on when we talk about nodes, we're not talking about the um, the K8s uh, notion of a nodes. We're talking oh graph about... nodes, graph nodes. Thank you for making me. Oh, I see. Right. Scrupulous. Okay. It's really, me scrupulous about my language. Um, I try to remember when talking about generic graph theory in a Kubernetes context to always call them graph nodes, but I don't always succeed. Yeah, same problem with ports, uh, namespaces. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you for calling me on that. Cool. So, so I think so we we could create a. Um, a graph node on demand when we see a new connection come in because technically until a client makes a connection request it's not technically part of the network service mesh world and so it would be reasonable to say that uh, the creation of a of a connection uh, adds it to it um so I'll let me sort of throw that out there, this out there. We, we've actually got a lot of folks working on this call who have pretty deep networking experience. I, I'd love to hear some other opinions about sort of at what point you would find it useful to know about the various nodes and links and the topology that's being visualized for you for network service mesh. Could some of the folks who speak up a little less frequently but who have a, quite a bit of depth of experience uh, speak up? Sorry, what, uh, what was the question uh, again, Ed? The question is, we've been sort of debating um, whether or not it, it's helpful to represent the network service endpoints as dangling nodes. In other words, nodes that have no edges yet um, when representing a topology, graph nodes in this case, graph nodes with no edges. Um, <clears throat> and so we've got a lot of people with a lot of depth of experience on this call in networks in varieties of ways. So I was, I was sort of asking, okay, so you run a network. Does it help you to see that there is a graph node in your topology that is completely without edges connecting to it yet? So, um, so this is Ian, by the way. I thought I joined this week for once because I actually found the meeting link. Um, the, um, what you really seem to be talking about if we compare it to the physical world is, here's a device in my rack. It's got no wires to anything. Should I represent it in my topology? And the usual answer that would be no. That would be silly. Don't do that. It's an inventory, but it's not. It's not topology. No, I think that's a that's a fair distinction. <clears throat> and and 
I think that's a fair distinction. And we, we, we essentially have available an inventory um, in the you know, Kubernetes API server if you, what you want is an inventory. Yeah, but, uh, and I mean, uh, so also uh, in this, I think it's uh, obviously two questions. How do you expose this through APIs so that, that Skydive can consume it? And how do you display it? Now, um, you know, as you say, it's exposed through APIs and, and Skydive could consume it and display it. But the point is that it's not a topology view that you would want to display it upon. It would be something slightly different. Yeah, yeah. Are we, are we talking about a view um, because me as an operator, and so I'm, I'm moving over from the abstract world to maybe an operator that want to that may want to see something like this. I would, I think, like to be able to see um, the candidate, if you will, um, uh, NSM endpoints. Yeah, so I mm. think I'll throw that out there. Comments. I think part of what we need to figure out is a couple of things. The first is sort of priorities. And the second is sort of what does Skydive currently offer? So for example, I'm currently sharing the Skydive thing. It has a tab for topology. It also has a tab for discovery. Um, and so I, one of the questions I think we may want to address to the Skydive people is, is this discovery tab really an inventory, right? Because if it's really an inventory, then <clears throat> obviously, you know, getting to Ian's very succinctly made point, uh, we might want to go feed that inventory in Skydive. Um, and then, the second point is sort of what are the priorities? I would maintain that visualizing topology um, in the immediate term is going to be higher priority than capturing and, and visualizing inventory in Skydive, if that is a feature in Skydive. Um, because what we're going to hope to show people at, at KubeCon very shortly is, in fact, visualization of an inventory. I'm sorry, visualization of a topology, not visualization of an inventory. Typically visualization. Yeah, when, when it comes to actually showing this off, you're going to want to show them what's wired. Now, I would emphasize whenever I've been doing NFE that those topologies actually turn out to be pretty, actually, pretty boring in practice. But um, um, so, you, you know, um, the one you're showing there is actually a lot more complex than actually usually turns up in reality. But um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're really trying to get. What, what exists as a beautiful node graph in your head is not necessarily very easy to communicate using words. That's where Skydive is going to help you. Um, the inventory uh, is not wired into that node graph. So the inventory of things that you could do is not so relevant. OK, I think that's quite reasonable. Um, awesome. So. In that scenario, should we just focus on the connections for now then? That, that seems to be what I think I'm hearing. Uh, is that what everyone else is hearing? For now, mm -hmm. I mean, what uh, we're, we're saying for QCon or that yes. will just be okay. Yeah, fair point. Whatever we can do to make it as simple as possible, given the tight time constraints, I'm all for it. Yeah, so let's let's focus on the connections uh, only then, and we can add things to the graph as they as they monitor publishes them, and uh, leave it like I, I think maybe not even we, we we have to monitor the deletion of uh, of of connections in in that scenario as well, and I think if we do that, we should. Uh, we should have something that can that can visualize that uh, that path very well. Um, to to ask a, a slightly meta question on this, is somebody documenting for future consumption how Skydive is is learning and unlearning these things? Because um, it seems to me that one of the things that's missing here that that, that kind of takes a backseat to everything else is it. it um, how we intend this to be used. And, and the example here of skydive getting hold of the topology is a fine thing where we should say, this is how we did this because this is what we intended. You know, a work example. Yeah, I, I think part of this really comes down to me, and I think this is getting to your question, which is, I, I feel like you're saying visualizing in skydive is all well and good, but um, what exactly are we going, how are we going to expose the things that skydive is consuming? Because there are going to be other more sophisticated consumers who are going to want to consume them. Yeah. I have a related uh, question. Yeah, Hi, it's uh, Magic. Um, what protocol is used to discover the topology? Is this something that is predefined, predetermined, or is there 
a freedom to choose anything and everything. Our current uh, our our current approach that we're looking at building is to have a uh, monitor connection in each uh, in each network service mesh uh, uh, or network service manager. So each agent on uh, on each node would have a monitor endpoint that you could uh, connect to. And this monitor will stream you a list of uh, of connections as they're created and destroyed. But but will it will it be just um, local links or will it be links and neighbors using some neighbor discovery protocols like IPv6 neighbor discovery or um, Ethernet LLDP or <laughs> I think what we're or, or or something new. I think what we're or, representing all here, of it. So I think what we'd be representing here, Machik, is the network service manager's viewpoint of the, the links that it's dealing with. And the network service manager knows quite a few things. It knows who the network service client is. It knows who the network service endpoint it's connecting on the other end is. And it knows you know, various details about that particular cross connection mm -hmm. that it can share. Um, given that, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, to, to go back to Ian's analogy of a data center, yes, you can run an LDP and sometimes that's helpful. But if the, literally the guy who connected the cables between the two servers has a perfect eidetic memory and 100% of the time knows precisely where those two ends of the cable are connected, you have a very powerful tool that doesn't require those kinds of things. Because for things like LLDP, we may or may not actually have both ends of the connection from a data a packet carriage point of view in the hands of the network service manager. It's just the one who set it up. Okay, thank you. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, so so I think we, we have a wealth of information off of a single, even just a single network service manager on a, on a node. And so one of the things that we'll, that we'll be able to do is be able to just monitor the connections on that. And uh, the, the one challenge that I can see though is that when you're listening to, suppose you have a cross connect that, that uh, crosses node boundaries, then uh, we we may want to have something that can uh, deduplicate and unify. Yeah, I mean, effectively, what you're getting in that case is a report from both ends of the link, um, and I, I'm almost certain that the the Skydive people have a way to deal with that because if you're trying to do this, Skydive is a series of probes and then something that collects from those probes, and so it, I know that Skydive does have situations in which it uses LLDP. And if you're using LDP, what you get is the report of one side's view of a link and the second side's view of the link. And then you've got to bring them together. So I'm pretty sure they've got that sorted out. Okay, so, so in that scenario, the action item that comes out is uh, we, have to, uh, we have to build the AI monitor, or sorry, an AI to build a monitor uh, for uh, publishing the local state that the network service manager knows of when the connections are created or destroyed. So I think that's the, yeah, that's the one thing that we have to add into this. Yep. <clears throat> cool, yeah. And uh, David, if you need any help, let, let us uh, let us know and uh, we'll, we'll help out as much as we, uh, as much as we can. Uh, all right, so let me summarize, right? Uh, so, Oh, uh, I'm waiting for maybe you or somebody to expose those APIs to me, and then I'm in charge of um, dealing with Skydive APIs to let the information I got to properly show down the topology, right? That's uh, that's correct. Okay, uh, I think if things is going well, I'm able to give you guys some demo this week. So yeah, that, that, that sounds good. So when it mm -hmm. don't, uh, let's not set an exact date for that just now until you have the monitor endpoint. So that way you have a yeah. full understanding of the complexity of that. End, of, of that. But mm -hmm. once, once you have enough information there and then uh, let, let, us, let us know at that point how you how you feel about giving a demo and when you'd like to. Uh, okay, no problem. Cool. Um, let's see, and 
Are, are there any other questions on the skydive or should we move on to our last uh, uh, item on the agenda? Okay, so Masiak now has uh, CNCF network service, VNF and CNF data plane benchmarks in comparison. So uh, I, you have the floor Masiak. Okay, um, actually I have most of the stuff uh, uh, already uh, typed in. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, it's it's already in your screen. Um, so, uh, Frederick, so if you could reshare, uh, I'm not in a position to share. My computer is uh, overloaded with stuff, and sharing will basically kill all the four cores that are currently processing on Max. So, if you could uh, reshare, please. One second, let me okay, share. I can quickly walk for the points. Yep, okay. let me or again, I, I, I'd stop sharing on the anticipation you would probably want to share and I can reshare. No, no, no. Cool. So, I do love sharing it, but uh, not a screen today. So <clears throat> um, there is a, a team uh, formed. Um, we had all sorts of um, uh, stuff uh, uh, churned uh, or team churned, uh, churned uh, churning uh, due to various things, mainly personal um, health related on the family side. That's Michael and uh, Ed. Uh, but uh, Michael is coming back online. Ed K will be back uh, on Wednesday. Um, Peter M, Mikus, and me from the FDA assisted commuter team are, are driving it. Um, and uh, uh, coordination and supervision is with uh, Taylor and uh, Lucina. Um, the, um, Alec Hodan joined the team as he's the, uh, the author of the NMV bench from OPND project. So he's now plugged in and he's fixing. Um, uh, one specific issue, uh, a bug, which is documented in the link that you will be able to click in a moment. The service topologies are VSC, CSC, CSP. I think we discussed this last week. Uh, if you click on this uh, link on the second bullet at, mm -hmm. you should get to the um, you should get to the HTML version of the current uh, status map as of 6th of November. They're gonna be now issued every day. And uh, the last uh, uh, number is basically a date in November. So it's 06 today. So if you go, you're already, you're already there. You don't need to open all of them. Okay. So you can see that we do have a multi-chain T-Rex latency, not measured and crashing uh, NLV bench. That is the issue that um, is hard to reproduce. It is only reproducible in a, in a larger scale environment. So Alec is, um, is diagnosing that now. Uh, he's in Pacific time zone. In the European time zone, uh, Peter is doing the tests. All the results are being pumped into the uh, CNCF repo um, as per the, the following links. All code is now done. We can basically do um, any combination of um, uh, the CNFs in the service chain or in the service pipeline. With VNFs, we have some acrobatics to do related to the dot one q part, but that is being Fix and might have been done. Uh, Peter's been hard at work, so may maybe he pushed it to the repo. I'll have a live from him um, tomorrow. I can check a git log. Um, so we are pretty much done with the uh, assisted version, and uh, it is now really uh, doing dry runs, exactly as Taylor said. And um, and then we are looking at fine tuning um, the uh, the setup. Uh, Michael is uh, partially back, and I believe Michael uh, is coordinating with you, Tyler. And apologies for missing the, the call earlier, but my calendar is not picking up Slack yet, so it needs to pick up the Slack. I am really using calendar, my calendar as a single source of truth for my time during the day, not multiple apps. But hopefully we can fix that. But I understand um, from the Slack conversation that, uh, and, and from Peter, uh, that is also using Slack with Michael, that uh, Michael is now basically taking the work done on FDIO assisted part. And he's doing the glue with you, the Ansible glue, so that uh, things can be automated um, for full one button or one key press, um, let's call it a green button press, uh, to run those environments in packet.net. And that will allow you to then further on um, abstract it in the orchestration stack so it can be you know, used in the future for driving larger systems. Um, so so um, uh, I'll let Taylor, if, you, if you're okay, let me just finish my update and I'll let you comment. So, so that's, that's where we are at packet.net. Um, I'm now, I think I should have in my inbox or on the Slack, 
the location of the uh, of the NICs and the way to access them for the packet.net. I would like to run some basic tests on the hardware level um, today if I can. And uh, if, if they are good and the NICs are placed okay and all is wired and uh, kosher, Ed Kern, um, when he will be coming online uh, tomorrow, um, he will basically start um, uh, testing it in coordination with Michael and um, and Peter. So that's pretty much the um, the software data plane uh, benchmarking part. And um, hopefully if things uh, work, we should uh, have uh, a, a good results by end of the week. We'll be comparing them with the Sysit 1810 release, which is shipping tomorrow. And it is on time on Skylakes, which are the same machines that are the same type of processors running in the, um, in the packet.net. And, um, and then they were gonna become a public reference for anything we test. And, and hopefully, you know, so far things are looking on time. I think the biggest risk I see is um, the packet.net uh, part because it is a third party operated system. And, um, and we don't know uh, whether it's all, all working, but uh, according Taylor for your communication on Slack and email, um, then the Intel NICs are there and, uh, and they are working. So, so maybe I'm just uh, a paranoid, but um, when we do a baseline calibration test, we should know within a day or two if we are good. And then it's just a question of um, dry runs. That's it, thank you. Cool. Great. So, I guess uh, did you have something to uh, to mention before we close it out, Taylor? Uh, I think that pretty much covered it. So that all of those updates as they're coming and and available, then we prioritize and merge in them in. Um, it's optimization and tuning for the performance side and then making sure that we can recreate stuff. So I said earlier, we have testing with the Mellanox uh, dual port and we just added the quad port. So the quad port NICs um, were not available fully until yesterday and some of them are available last week. So we got started, but um, that's in there and you know, we'll keep doing testing and validation and make sure everyone else can recreate any of those tests. Nice. And um, okay, well with that, um, one, last, uh, one last note. Uh, so Travis has now been killed off of the, uh, uh, off the repo. So uh, that's, that was just merged in. And with that, uh, I uh, want to thank everyone for your time, and we will see you again next week at the same time. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.